and welcome to our session today on 10 common canine behavior issues that most pet parents might be facing. So, and let's start so we don't waste everybody's time. Now, when we look at the world of dogs, you know, before we just jump into the problems, I want to start off where it started. When we look at dogs and how they were domesticated over the years and how man befriended a dog, you take the original animal, the wolf, and over the years, what you'll see is as man domesticated the dog and made it his friend, and we've changed their shape and their size and their color and their fur. But what you've got to keep in mind is 86% of the way they think and they behave is rooted in their ancestor. We've only managed to change a little bit of it. But yet, interestingly, over the years, now I've been working for over 27 years in this field. You know, when we started, dogs were dogs. Now, you see, interestingly, dogs are treated as human babies. How many of you do that? Please put that in the chat box and tell me about that. And now we see human babies put on leashes like dogs. So sometimes I look at all of this and I wonder, what is this world coming to? And when we work with dogs and we live with dogs and we share our homes with them, the first thing you have to keep in mind all of this evening and from today onwards is, you know, dogs are not the same as humans. We cannot, I mean, we call them everything, right? My furry best friend and my furry baby and my, I know people who call them son, my daughter, or that's fine. But you know, when you want to see what the dog thinks like, then you've got to see it from their point of view. It's a whole different species. So that's the time you've got to stop trying to be like a human in thought and try to see it from their point of view. And this picture I love because it clearly shows what we see and we perceive in the world is so different compared to what the dog sees. And over the years that I've been doing canine behavior work, you know, a lot of people ask me, what is it you do? Do you put the dog on the couch? Do you ask him if his mother was cruel to him as a puppy? I don't do any of that. We work in the science of psychology, where we work through patterns of behavior, and we work through the simple principles of psychology as well. And as a behaviorist, I would say, you know, over the years, the problems that I've worked with would include, you know, a lot of cases we get for barking and all these problems. But I'd say in the last two to three years, especially after COVID, I've gotten to see tons of dogs with aggression issues and fear issues. Now, if you are struggling with any of those issues, I want you to put your comments, I want you to put your thoughts, I want you to put your questions into the chat box. Because once we've finished with the webinar, I'll be answering those later on. But I want to hear back. How many of you struggle with your dogs? One of the main issues we see is dog-to-dog -dog reactivity. I, I would say today maybe seven out of 10 city dogs cannot and will not get along with other dogs. And that's a huge number when we look at it. And today in our session, we're going to delve into all of these issues. Now, for those of you who like canine behavior, you find today's session really interesting. We do have a more in-depth course coming up from in a week from now, I think, where we cover all of these in depth. So whether it's for you and your dog, or you're already into this field a bit and you think you're not sure of the knowledge, then that could be the perfect course for you. We will give details on that course as we progress. But here's a small thing for all of you. For those of you who stick through till the end, there's a surprise gift for you towards the end of this webinar. So I hope you don't find it very boring and you stick through. And even if you do find it boring, stick through because of the gift, okay? Let's move first. So the first problem we normally would see. So we've got a list of issues we're going to cover today. And one of the main problems everybody says is, my dog doesn't listen to my no command. So I want to ask you, does your dog listen to your no command? Does your dog allow that? Does your dog listen when you say no? Does he stop what he's doing? I want you to put that in the chat box. I want to hear your answers. How many of your dogs listen when you say, hey, no, stop what you're doing. Just stop it. 
multiple people come and say, I'm saying no to the dog. I'm shouting no to the dog. I am screaming no to the dog and he's not listening to me. And then I say, okay, show me the way you say no. And then no command is just the gentlest and sweetest no command. And I say, there's no way your dog's going to listen to that. So let's take a look at this lady and see her no command. Poor thing, she, she can't get it right. So you watch this puppy. I think she's trying to pray. And this little young dog is just playing, pulling a sari in the bargain. And she's probably saying a no. But can you see how she says the no? She's laughing. So the dog doesn't see it as a no command, right? And then she ignores, hoping that the behavior will go away. That's not going to work either. Then the dog drops something else. Now that's not helping further. She's even tried to give this sm a small whack to the dog. Dog's not hurt that at all. So can you see she's saying something to the dog? Dog is completely understanding something else. And eventually, she's to resort to this lion tamer mo, you know, that tool that they use in the circus, that kind of a thing. Not that it's really healthy. So if you struggle with a no command, and this looks familiar to you, here's what you have to understand. When we communicate with dogs, it has to be clear-cut communication. You know, dogs cannot understand mixed signals. And here's one thing you have to learn. When we talk to dogs or when we communicate, it's not just what we say to them or the tone of voice or the loudness. What they are naturally born to read is your full body language, right? From head to toe is what they read. So if I want to say yes to the dog, my face, my expression should be pleasant. My shoulders will be relaxed. My hands will be relaxed. So you see a whole very pleasant positive demeanor to the whole thing. So I'd be like, oh, what a good boy you are. That is such a good doggy you are. So you see, tone is pleasant and everything is nice. Now on the other extreme, if I want to say no to the dog, all of that changes. Okay, so it, my face will become stern, my shoulders will become tight and I might go like, no, back. Can you see the drastic opposites that I've created? Now what most people do is what this lady did in the middle, right? Say your dog jumps on the sofa and you want him to get off. What most people, I mean, get down. What are you doing? <laughs> Be a good boy. No, no, no. Can you see how conflicting it is? So when the dog looks at us and then says, what are you saying? Oh, you're saying it so well. Maybe that's not a no command. And that's why they don't understand it. You have to be, if you want to communicate with your dog, very clear cut in your communication. That's, it's as simple as that. And interestingly, I see people just getting louder for some strange reason. Your dog is not deaf. No need to get louder. Just be more clear in the way you're communicating. So we're going to see now the next clip. If here. I've got no, no bug, no. no. Okay, and this is a little beagle who a no command just would not work with the pet parent. And you see the way I said it to the dog. It was just firm. You don't, you know, here's the thing. If you're good at communicating, you don't need to ever raise your hand on a dog. I'm not in favor of that because I believe if we just speak clearly, they listen. They know how to listen. It's They get naughty when they can't understand what we're saying to them sometimes. So in this video, what you saw, it was a clear cut. No, no, don't. It's my biscuit. Leave it alone. And the minute the dog got that through my body language, I'll play it again for you to see. It's a very quick video. You'll see that the dog said, oh, well, all right. Okay, so watch here again. If I've got no, no bug, no, no. Okay. Just enough for the dog to get the message. That's it. And interestingly, there's no screaming, there's no shouting, there's no hitting. None of that is needed when you say a no command to the dog. And you know what a lot of people say, and I've had people say, oh, my trainer told me, don't say no. You'll break your relationship with the dog. Oh, he won't like you. But no is a basic behavior. You have to have that in the dog. Otherwise, your dog's going to grow up to be like a brat. Right? It doesn't have to be harsh, but it has to be taught to the dog. Let's take a look at the next very common issue I would see even argument that I have with a lot of pet parents. 
do dogs show guilt? What is your answer to that? You tell me. Do you think a dog looks guilty when scolded? A lot of people tell me, you know what? I came home to find that he had destroyed my sofa. So I took him to the sofa and I scolded him. And you know what? He knew he had done wrong. He was guilty. How many of you agree with that statement? Put it in the chat box. How many of you say, oh yes, definitely. My dog is very guilty. He knows when he has done something wrong. And here is what I'm always saying to people. In the world of dogs, this is what you have to know. When one dog, now understand it again. Remember not humanizing it, understanding it from the canine viewpoint. When one dog is being aggressive to another dog and that second dog does not want to contest that, what they typically show is very submissive body language. As if they make the eyes small, they'll cower, they'll be like appeasement gestures. In the human world, we read that as, ha, see, he's being guilty. But in the dog world, basically what that dog is saying is, you're angry, probably for what I don't know, but you're angry and I don't like that. So to appease your anger, I'm going to show you submissive language. As humans, we misread that as guilt when it's not true. They don't have that. Do dogs have emotions? Of course they do. Do they share a lot of our emotions? Yes. But not all are complicated emotions. You know, so when you look at it from the purest behavior point of view, we might, as purists say, they don't have jealousy. They don't have guilt. They don't have spite. Those are more human emotions. So here's what you've got to understand. And this is important. If you want to scold a dog for something, if you want to praise a dog for something, you've got to get it done at that point in time. <clears throat> Otherwise, he is not going to connect it to the act. <clears throat> Sorry. And then all you're going to see is what looks like <clears throat> a guilty dog or a submissive dog, and you're going to misunderstand that. So be careful about that. That is something I find a lot of people make a mistake with. Now, our next biggest issue, and I want to stop to ask all of you this. How many of you have a problem leaving your dog alone at when you go out? How many of you say, I can't? Now, if you look at this cartoon, how many of you identify with this lady? And how many of your dogs identify with a dog like this? It's interesting to know. Okay. How many of you say, I can't, my dog just won't stay alone. There will be problems. He'll howl the place down. And, you know, I would say maybe more so after COVID, we see a lot of these issues because during COVID, a lot of people went and got dogs. Then those dogs were never really left alone. So they never knew how to be alone. And then after COVID, it's just you have a, like a large pandemic of dogs saying, we don't know how to be kept alone at home. Okay, so let's take a look at the way we think. You know, when we look at things from the behavior angle. Now, if you were to do that course that's coming up, it's an online dog behavior course. It's just going to be held in the mornings on Zoom. So for those of you who find all this interesting, that might be something worth doing. Now, when you do that course, you'll see the way we think. From the behavior angle, what we always want to do is go to the root of the problem. And that's what I want you to keep in mind. Always when you work with dogs, work at the root of the problem. What you typically see sometimes when a dog is barking, jumping, stealing, we call those the symptoms. That's, like I say, the top of the iceberg. But if you really want a long-term solution, you have to learn to work at what you can't see. So the first thing we look at with any problem is what could be causing that problem. Now, with a dog that won't stay alone, there are many reasons. Now, for all those of you who commented that your dog won't stay alone at home, I want you to tell me which reason you think it could be for your dog here. Very often with rescue dogs, we find that they are not okay being left alone. And part of that is the reason why we bring them home. You see, that sometimes, it is a person who feels very sorry for that dog who brings that dog home. And now because you felt sorry for that dog, you tend to allow the dog a lot of things in the hope of by doing that, you make his life better. 
And one of the things we tend to allow is the dog clinging to us, following us room to room, sometimes into the bathroom, sleeping with us, <clears throat> all of that. And what that very quickly does to a dog that did not know a home before this may be, or unfortunately saw the people he loved and lived with, go away and never come back. It's the perfect formula to create separation issues. So it always, if you really see the clingy person who lived with clingy dog, it's always that way. You can never separate the behavior of a person from the behavior of a dog. Sometimes it's just a single puppy in the litter, never knew how to cope, deal with things, all of that. Sometimes sickness in puppyhood can lead to these issues. Sometimes you have a dog that was fine being left alone and then suddenly out of the blue, people say, I don't know, out of the blue, one day he's not okay. And when we look back, we say, maybe something happened when he was alone. So when you look at the various reasons here, I would say one of the most common is allowing a dog to overbond to the human being. And who allows that? It's a human being. So we always say this, and this is something you keep in mind. You can never separate the behavior of a dog from the behavior of the people the dog lives with. So if you have a clingy dog, there is somebody at home who's equally clingy to the dog. If you have the dog at home being completely naughty, being a brat, you have somebody at home who's allowed the dog to do all of this. So think about it now differently. So what can we do? Now, these are important points. If you struggle with this issue, I suggest you make a note of these. First step, don't allow your dog to follow you room to room. If your dog's going everywhere with you, how are you ever going to teach him, hey, it's okay to be alone? So the first step starts with just telling your dog, you know what, I'm going to go down in the bathroom. I'm going to be there for five, 10 minutes. You have to learn to cope being outside. Start with small things. Your dog does not have to come room to room to room. Now, second point. For a lot of people, this would break their heart. No, my dog sleeps with me. Otherwise, I can't sleep. They say, that's fine. Now, here's what you have to know. Having a dog sleep with you in bed is not going to create separation issues. But if your dog already has them, maybe then sleeping in bed is not really the best idea. But if this is going to break your heart, then maybe allow this point, try to do the other stuff. And like I said, point number three, it's a human being who's clingy. And in COVID time, we saw that people just hugging their dogs and sitting with their dog. Poor dog sleeping in the corner, they'd wake him up and bring him to the sofa. Don't do that. You also learn to have your own life without hovering around. Don't, don't be like a helicopter dog pet parent. Okay? Number four, Spend time with your dog in a creative way. I always say quality better than quantity. You don't have to spend six hours with your dog. Even one or two hours of good quality time, engaging time, playing with your dog, all of that is far more powerful than six hours of just bleh kind of time together. Okay, that's not going to be very useful for the dog. Number five, and this I think is very important, and I start this with puppies. I beg of you, if you have a puppy at home, please, please, please teach your puppy how to be by himself for a few hours every day. So what I would tell people during COVID is, you know, in the afternoons, leave your dog alone. Let him go into the bedroom. Let him sleep by himself. Let him learn to enjoy his own company. You know, this is a skill we have to teach our dogs. If you haven't taught it to your dog, what you see is your dog even if you try to leave him alone, your dog will say, oh my God, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be by myself. And that is a skill you have to teach them. Kind of like how we teach children today. Hey, you can be by yourself and enjoy your own company. And it's a simple process. Just start maybe 10 minutes, maybe give him a chew stick, a stuffed kong, something and say, sit with this now for 10 minutes. Enjoy it. I'll be in another room. That's a big step if you can take that. Another thing we do a lot of times for this behavior issue is teach a dog like a go to bed or a settle down command. And you can, when you say, hey, go to bed, the dog should run to maybe his bed or whatever surface you put, like an old blanket or a, a certain place you tell him to go. And he should go there happily. Never send him there as a punishment. He should go there and rest and he should know, hey, this is a fun place. Maybe there's a treat hidden in my bed. 
Maybe there's a toy somewhere and make it a fun, relaxing zone to go to. Dogs that already have that skill are far easier to teach to be by themselves than dogs that don't have that skill. If any of you want a small tutorial on that, put it in the chat box and I'm more than happy to send it to you later. I have videos on all of this. And you know, just a pause in this, after maybe a year or so, maybe more than that, people have kept saying, we want to learn online dog training. Finally, in May, we're going to have an online dog training course. Um, so for those of you who are interested, keep an eye out on our social media. We'll be announcing it there. How else can you help the dog? Now, here's what we know. Generally anxious dogs are worse off when left alone than dogs that are more confident. So parallelly, what you do is build confidence in the dog, right? Play confidence building games. You can play tug games and scenting games and do a little bit of fun agility in the house. All of that can make your dog into a more confident, outgoing dog. And that could mean when left alone, your dog does not feel as stressed as he would have done before. So, and what is the simple tool to build all this confidence? It's just games. Play games with your dog. Play lots of games, any different things. And the more stuff your dog learns, the better his confidence levels will be. And number nine, keep your dog busy. If all day long your dog is thinking, now what, now what? Oh, I'm alone, I'm alone. And it's going to build. You don't want that. You've got to keep your dog's mind like, oh, today we did this. Evening, are we going to go there? What is that I can hear? What is that I can smell? And his mind is so focused on that. that by the time he figures it out, he'll say, I didn't even know I was alone for half an hour. You want to keep the mind occupied all the time. And on this note, I'm sorry to say it, but the people who are clingy to their dogs, we want your mind also equally occupied and kept busy, okay? Because otherwise, you're also sitting and saying, oh, I'm alone, dog is alone, what are we going to do? And you work yourself into a ladder. Go get a hobby, go practice a hobby, go for dance class, go for painting class, go do something so that you and your dog can learn to live together, but also not being clingy. Okay, and the last point I really wanted to make for all of you here is, you know, a lot of people when their dogs truly get stressed out and left alone, they say, what is this nonsense? You're just doing all this to spite me. You're just doing all this because I didn't take you with me. And we think our dogs are being mean or spiteful or difficult or pretending. Now, here's what you have to know. With genuine cases, all right? These dogs genuinely cannot help it. They're really having like a breakdown. So please be patient with them. Understand that they have an issue and then help them work through that. Okay. The next problem we're going to look at is fussy eating. How many of your dogs are fussy eaters? Now, you know, when I'm asking all of you, how many of your dogs have this? Some of you might be saying, hey, don't say anything. What does she think? No, my dogs in the past were fussy eaters. I, I had a cocker spaniel and my mother at that time when she used to feed the dog, I think we fed too much to the dog. In the morning, he got like milk and bread. Then in the evening, he got like a big bowl of meat and veggies and rice and all of that. So, so what happened is there were times of the months, you know, of the year as such that he'd go off his breakfast. He wouldn't have it. And typically, like a typical maternal figure, it's always maternal figures, by the way, I think, who cause fussy eating. My mother would panic. She'd say, he'd die. He's not going to die. Dog's not going to die if he skips breakfast. But what she started to do, she was hand feed the dog. And then she started putting jam on his food. I don't know where that idea came from, but she put jam. And now because there was jam, he ate it. And she proved her point. You know, when I tell her, mom, he doesn't want it, leave him alone. And this was way before I started doing dog behavior work. I was young. I was, what, 12, 13 at that time. I used to tell her, he doesn't want it. Let it be. She said, no, no. He has to eat. He has to eat. And then she did that. Okay, so even my dogs have had behavior issues. So don't think you're alone in this. So what are the reasons? You can see they're all listed here. But I would say a couple of them that we have to first look at. All right? One, it's typically sometimes if it's a learned behavior, it's 
taught by somebody at home. And like I said, I've rarely seen men following up like this. It's mostly women who have the strong maternal instinct where they'd say, oh, poor dog, if he doesn't eat, he's going to die. Dog's not going to die. Some, and here's the interesting thing. You know, fussy eating dogs are actually quite plump. Yeah, and I look at those dogs when the owner says, my baby will die. And I say, God, he has enough fat reserves to last him a year if he didn't feed. Because you don't say it to the clan, but still. All right? So here's the thing. It's very often creative. It typically can be this, where one day when you put the food down, for some reason the dog might say, I don't want it today, I'm not hungry, don't like it, bored. It could be anything. And then somebody panics and either hand feeds the dog or adds something tasty or changes the meal altogether. And then the dog says, oh, this was good. Let's try it again tomorrow. Let's try it. And then what you have is a dog, and even if he likes the food in front of him, he's going to wait and say, right, if I wait, what else will you add? What kind of attention will I get if I wait? Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, oh, but my dog is like that. And here is the dangerous part. It's not good for your dog to be a fussy eater. It's not good for his health. It's not good for his digestive system. It's not good for his relationship with food. Also, what I tell people is this. You know, if your dog is truly sick, one of the main signs of that would be a dog going off his food. And that then could be a sign to run to the vet. But if you don't know whether your dog's just being fussy or genuinely sick, you could lose that precious time before you went to the vet. So I always say, don't keep your dogs onto this habit. And you know, interestingly, a lot of people share with me these social media videos where you see women opening the mouth, stuffing food, and everybody's commenting, how sweet, how kind, I'm cringing. I think, that's not kind. That poor dog does not know how to eat on his own. That's not kind. And I've had tons of clients who then got stuck where they say, you know, it's come to a point where he would rather never eat again than ever eat on his own. So you've just ruined that dog's relationship with food. So don't do that. Another thing I want to cover is point number two here. A lot of times when a dog is fussy, look for signs of illness. And one of the things we tend to miss out altogether is the mouth. You know, it could be a tooth at the back that's paining him. Maybe he's cut his tongue. Maybe his gums are inflamed. You know, any pain in the mouth, any pain in the throat, stomach, body, anything could create fussy eating. Which is why if your dog has been eating normally and suddenly out of the blue becomes fussy, pause, run to the vet. And then you see the typical other causes that I've already talked of. Right? Sometimes the dog's just bored with food. Um, sometimes the dog just says, not interested. It could be various things. But by and large, what I would look for two things to begin with is, is it a health issue? Two, has somebody in the house created this as a habit? So what can we do? Simple tricks to put this right. First step, and this is the simple program you used to give out in the olden days, right? Make a balanced diet and put it down. If your dog eats, he eats. If he doesn't, that's fine. In 10 minutes, pick it up. No other food, no snacks, nothing till the next meal time. Typically, you'd have dogs not eating for one day, but by the next morning, most of them would be hungry and they'd eat. And while the program is simple and straightforward, we find a lot of human beings would cheat because my poor baby is dying. Here, let's give him one biscuit. Now, one biscuit is all a dog needs to survive and not eat the next meal. So then the programs won't work. So honestly, if you have this issue, and you do want to put it right, then you have to be a little strict about it. Other tricks that we've tried when a lot of dogs have, you know, had their relationship with food completely ruined because of this fussy eating gone on for too long. Sometimes we make it like into the hunt. So, you know, activates that part of the brain where it says, go on a hunt. So scatter feeding. Um, don't, don't go on a real hunt, just the same. Um, so scatter feeding is a good idea, right? where you scatter the food all around the house. If it's dry pellets, you take it maybe. If you have grassy lawn, scatter it there. So now your dog is using his nose, he's using his brain, he's using his paws, mouth. You know, when you see how an animal eats, it's using all of these things. And that can create hunger in some of them. 
sometimes dog eats the same food every day. Some dogs don't like it. They get bored with it. Now, if you still want to do that, how about give that food because it's a balanced diet maybe, but just add some taste to it. Add a little bit of curd one day to that the pellets you're feeding. Maybe next day, add a bit of home-cooked dal without the masala in it. You know, just be a little creative. Add a little flavor. That's all. It doesn't need to be part of the meal as such, but just a little flavor to keep, you know, the tastiness alive. And very often we see some dogs not doing anything the whole day. Obviously, they're not going to eat. So step up the exercise. That builds the hunger. Sometimes it's just a new place. Very often people say, in my house, my dog doesn't eat. That dog comes to my house, starts eating perfectly for strange reasons, and they're amazed. And I think part of that has to do with the last point. You see, when I feed them, they see my dog eating really fast, and they copy her sometimes. So all of these little tips and tricks could work for you if you have a fussy eater. Now, here's the thing, guys. I'd love you to try all of this and get back to me. Let me know how this is working out for you. And now a question I get asked all the time. I don't think my dog loves me. Does my dog love me? And they show me their dog's picture. And I say, well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. So how can you tell whether your dog is happy or unhappy? And I think just to put it very simply. So in this webinar, we're covering everything in a very simple manner. If you really want to study dog behavior language in depth, our online course is the course you have to come for. I have some very interesting new videos showing in that what dogs are saying, how we study their postures, their expressions, their, their muscles, how we study all of that to know what they're saying. And I'll tell you one thing, it's the most fascinating topic. Because once you understand what a dog is saying to you and, and they're communicating, you never look at a dog the same way again. So just a brief description now to tell whether your dog's happy or unhappy. Now, before we go into that, quick question. How many of you say, when a dog wags his tail, he is a happy dog? Put that in the chat box. Does a tail wagging mean happy dog or not? I want to know your answers. I want to know. And remember here, Nobody is going to check who's right, who's wrong. Definitely not me. I want to just know what you have to say. So write your answers. I love hearing from all of you. So when we look at tail wags, this is now something very important. So pay attention to it. You always look at the full picture. You know, like I taught you with the no command. The dog is reading every part of you. Your face, your expression your tone, your shoulders, the muscles, how they're held, all of that. So the first tail wag we look at is where the tail is up stiff, wagging stiffly side to side. In this case, it's not a friendly tail wag. A dog will wag his tail like that before he bites you. What we do, and I, this is what I teach, you have to read the entire picture. If you looked at these dogs, see the two pictures, the tail will be up stiff, See, the shoulders are tight. See, the face is tight. The ears are forward. These dogs don't look friendly also. See, And we'd say they could be in a state of arousal, like what is going on kind of a behavior. See that. And the tail will be doing that. When you see a dog doing that, he's basically saying, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm alert. Maybe I'm being aggressive. Maybe I'm thinking of all of that. But I'm in that state of mind. Basically saying, don't keep approaching. Don't touch me. Definitely don't hug and kiss me. I'm not going to be okay with that. The second tail wag we look at is, you know, where the tail is in line with the body. Swishing happily side to side. This is the tail wag you get when you come home and your dog greets you. You see the rest of the face is very relaxed. The ears are relaxed. Shoulders are relaxed. And generally when you look, you say, ah, that's a happy tail. Okay, look at this tail wag. That's what it looks like. Happy, friendly dog. That's your happy dog. Now, these dogs you can approach, talk to, play with, whatever. The third tail wag we look at is where the tail is below. And you look at the rest of the picture. The eyes are small, crouching. Ears have gone back. See the, the, the lips, they've gone like that. These are worried dogs. They could be fearful, anxious, nervous, worried. Basically, this dog, if he's doing this to you, is clearly saying, don't come closer, I'm not okay with it. 
my suggestion is leave these dogs alone. Do not keep approaching because the next step could be a bite. And you know, just when you look at a dog now and you look at the full picture, that's all I wanted to teach you just in this month. Look at the full picture, see the eyes, see the ears. The whole picture tells you, is your dog happy? Is he unhappy? Typically, we've always just read with one body part of the tail. I want to tell you, don't read the tail in isolation. Read all of it together. Then you get what the dog is truly saying. If you read one part, you could make a dangerous mistake. And you know, just using this much, you can tell whether your dog is happy or unhappy. Now, how many of you still want to ask me, but does my dog love me? I don't know why people ask me that, um, but they do. How many of you want to know that answer and you want to know what the answer to that is? If there are more than 10 to 15 people asking that question, I'll give you that answer at the end of the session today. Right. And on that note, how do you approach a dog? Sometimes I see all these weird videos of how people are approaching. Um, sometimes you see scaringly, person goes right into the with his legs into the face of the dog and I'm going oh no or if the dog was going to bite you really don't want certain parts of your body being bitten it would be very very painful so how do you approach a dog first step don't make direct eye contact dogs do not by body language do not like rah, like that don't go straight in like you know straight sudden I'm going to change the camera but you see don't make a frontal gesture dogs find that intimidating now, when you understand this, I'm going to pause this for a bit to teach you something. When two dogs want to get into a fight, the first step in a dog fight will be when one dog stares the other down. Now, see the way I'm looking? I'm looking at you nicely. Now, watch how this changes. So that stare, that was different kind of a look. The other dog can look at it and say, oh, I'm not comfy and turn his head away. That means no fight can happen. The next step will be they vocalize and the third step will be where they go touch each other. At any step, the dogs can split it up altogether. All right. So here's what you have to do. When you go to a dog and you go stare the dog in the eye because that's human nature. Then we say hi doggy and we touch. What do you think some dogs who have not lived around human beings are thinking? She looked, she spoke, she touched, bite. And that's how we get bitten sometimes. And a lot of people are confused. They say, but I was just saying hi. I get that you were saying hi, but the dog didn't see it as a hi. So sorry. All right. So how do we do it? Don't make direct eye contact. Look at the dog, but don't look directly at the dog. Preferably don't say anything unless you see the dog is being friendly. Don't make sudden movements. Approach from your side. Hopefully your side is narrower. My side, front, all the same side. So hopefully yours is a little different. Approach from the side. The dog finds that a little more calming. So you see this approach here. It's from the side. And when you touch a dog, now see this hand. If it goes over the head, the dog says, I don't like that. I'm scared. So ideally keep your hand where the dog can see it. And then the chances of you getting bitten are low. See, see the person looming? The dog's going, oh, I don't like that. And the dog is more relaxed when the person is from the side. Now let's move to the next behavior. I think a lot of people ask, what about humping in dogs? Now when people say, my dog humps me, oh, what to do? Shall we just neuter the dog? My first thing to people is, you know, humping occurs for various reasons in dogs. It's not always a sexual behavior. In fact, in puppies as young as five to six weeks, even before the sex hormones have kicked in, we see it. Sometimes the dog can be frustrated and to take that out, he'll hump. Sometimes they do it because it gets attention, right? As soon as they start humping, maybe they started in play. And as they did that, people started to give attention. Sometimes dogs hump each other when they're trying to dominate each other. Sometimes it can be sexually related. Very often with dogs, you know, when you overstimulate, lots of excessive patting, touching, rubbing, You'll see some dogs starting to hump, especially if you do it a lot on the chest area. It can be excitement related. They're too excited, they can start humping. Sometimes it's stress. Sometimes it just could be a medical issue. You have to look like I, I'm teaching you, go to the root cause. 
what is causing the humping behavior and work on that. The humping, which is the symptom, will go away on its own. All right? And that's how you have to work. There is no one-stop solution. But basically what I'm going to say is it doesn't mean you just stand there and let the dog hump you. Ideally, what you should do, you should be able to stay firm no and stop the dog. I know a lot of people will say, oh, the way we deal with it, we just stand and wait. When he finishes, he goes. You don't have to do that. All right? So the basic thing is you can physically stop. If your dog snaps at you when you try to stop him, you definitely need more help than just this much advice. Maybe you need a behaviorist to guide you on that because there could be an underlying aggression tone over there. But ideally, you should just pull by the collar and say, hey, no, don't do that and pull the dog away. Maybe you can distract him, give him something else to do. And then what I always teach people is this. Watch when he does it. What is the trigger? What causes this behavior to start? And that's what you have to learn to curb. Learn to handle the triggers. Learn to handle the signals. Okay. Our next topic we're looking at is fear. Now, this is, I would say, something a lot of people misunderstand. Whether you have a dog that's frightened of other dogs, frightened of people, it all comes down to the same thing. Where does it start? It could start for various reasons. It can be something taught by the mother dog. It can be because the dog wasn't socialized well. It could be a fearful experience. It could be any of those. It's typically about five to six months that you notice that your dog has fear, whether it's to people or to other dogs. Right? Now, here is what you have to understand. Understand these principles. When any animal, whether it's a dog or it's a human being, when we're scared of something, the first thing that we tend want to do is flight behavior, which means run away. Have you ever gone to a street dog and approached? Have you seen what they do if they don't want to interact with you? They run away. They just move away from where you are. As long as a dog is allowed flight, you really don't have problems. But the problem starts because we as human beings force our dogs to make friends, right? We're like, no, 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 come on, make friends. And even worse, if that person is over-friendly and says, come on, I'm friendly with all dogs, come on, I'll teach you to be my friend. And that dog said, I tried to go away, I could not. Maybe he's on the leash, maybe he's cornered, maybe he's in a kennel, it could be any reason, right? He said, I tried to increase my distance, it did not happen. So the second thing we typically see is either they're going to freeze, They'll be still. Have you sometimes seen that? Those of you who've seen that, either with your own dog or street dogs, if you've observed, you'll notice. Sometimes you come close to one of them and rather than running away, some of them will just go. They'll like become a statue. They're clearly communicating, I'm not comfortable. If that also doesn't work, the third thing the dog might do is try to play down the situation. You know, they, they do play bows, they pretend play, they'll uh, maybe sniff the ground, lick their lips, give you all those gestures to say, oh, the situation's really stressing me out. Have you noticed as humans, we don't read any of that. We're just so blind to it. We just say, ah, it's okay. He's friendly. He's playful. And then what happens? Then the dog says, look, I tried to tell you I'm scared. You did not listen to step one, two, and three. And I had no choice but to use step number four. And that is something we need to avoid. Which brings me to the simple principle of this. If you have a fearful dog, how many of you have fearful dogs? For whatever reason, I want you to put that in the chat box. I'll be reading all your comments later. And I want you to tell me what your dog is scared of. I want you to tell me that. Some of you have already signed up for our online course. In that, you tell me what you want to learn more. Do you want to learn how to help a dog scared of people? A dog scared of other dogs. Maybe a dog scared with sounds. Because all our programs are today's modern day programs and we can change those behaviors. So just keep one thing in mind. When you look at your dog and he's being scared, you have to understand what is taught. If he's saying, can I have some time to decide what to do? And can I have some distance? To be so close to something that scares me, I'm not comfy. That's the thing. Take a picture of this slide in your mind and keep it there. When I look at a fearful dog, I say, what is it do you want? 
And the dog is saying, can I have some time to figure this out? And can we increase the distance between me and what is scaring me? So how do you do this? So today's session is just a lighter webinar, just to give you a, an arrow to point you in the right direction for this, okay? Um, like I said, if you do need more help, maybe connect with me, I'll refer you to a behaviorist. For those of you who are enjoying this and saying, I would love to learn about this more, I, I definitely think the 10-day online course would be the perfect place for you to start. It's pretty in-depth without really going into the whole professional angle of it. So it really can teach you quite a bit. Also, if you've just been frustrated trying different things and nothing's worked, that course could help you out. And like I said, for all of those of you who wait another 10 minutes, I think we're reaching the end point. There is a surprise gift in it for you. So here's the thing. How can you help? First, know the trigger. What makes your dog scared? Can you avoid that altogether? Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, no, but I want him to be friends. My suggestion to you is this. If your dog is clearly saying, I'm not comfortable, I'm really scared, don't you think it's time we started listening to them? And see, maybe in some situations, you don't have to have other dog friends. Maybe in some situations, your dog is happy only knowing Maybe his own family of humans and a couple of human friends, but does not want to be friends with the world in general. My suggestion to you is let that be. Just let it be. Don't push. Because when you push and force friendship, force the dog to confront his fears, that is when you're going to end up with aggression. Okay? Second, you can introduce a safe place. Okay, a safe place where the dog can go to. So I'll give you a quick example. I had a client and she had an indie dog, which she had adopted. And this dog, she'd tell me, you know, as the dog started to grow seven months, anytime somebody came home, she said that dog would be scared and would start with the barking. And the barking typically is, whoa, 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 very scared barking. And she started to notice then over time, as people started to come and she tried to make them make friends with the dog, slow growls were started to be heard. So what we did simply with her dog is taught her dog, when the doorbell rings, go into the bedroom and sit. You don't have to face the person coming in. And the dog starting to do that, she had to first tell the dog every time, you know, go, go to bed. Why don't you go settle down in bed? It's your safe zone. I'll make sure nobody comes there that you're not comfy with. The dog grew so comfortable with that, that on its own, when the dog doorbell rang, the dog would run and sit in the bed. And if he kind, and then he'd peep out of the door. If he saw someone he liked, he'd come and say hi. If he didn't like, he'd sit in the bedroom. And just by doing that, the word aggression was removed from that situation. Another thing you can do, if it's only fear and the word aggression is not in the picture, maybe try and associate strangers with fun stuff. So what, one thing that I could do is maybe say if my dog likes playing fetch. When a guest comes over, I'd say, right, let's play fetch. I, I get the guest to throw the ball. The dog comes, gives it to me because he might be too scared to go and give it to the guest. I give it to the guest, the guest throws it. What's going to happen with a couple of guests doing that? My dog is going to start thinking, oh, guests who come home, play fetch with me. What a lot of fun they are. Remember one thing. I prefer not to use food to make friends with fearful dogs. I prefer to use games. And there's a whole deeper reason for that. But just for now, all you need to know, don't use food to teach a dog to creep closer to you. That can really backfire. And like I told you earlier, just respect the dog. If he doesn't want to be friends, if he's too scared, then why not just avoid those situations altogether? So like I said, I want to hear what is your dog scared of? How many of you are already th thinking of signing up for the online behavior course? Because for those of you, there's a special gift as well. Now we're coming to our last two issues we're going to cover. And it's good to see most of you have stayed till the end. Does neutering help? Now here's the thing. There's a huge belief that if you have a problem with the dog, neuter the dog and the problem will magically disappear. That is not true. That's not how it is going to work. What we do know, and you can read this research that I've put there while I talk to you, is in a lot of cases, now that we know, and that was what we said in the old days, 
past, you know, 30 years ago when I worked, to a large extent, we'd also say, if your dog's aggressive, neuter, 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 neuter everything. Um, now we know with more research, more new research done, that that doesn't always work. In fact, neutering, you must know this, neutering will only show a difference in the behavior if the hormones played a role in that behavior. If your dog says biting somebody because he's scared, then you can neuter till kingdom come. Removing the hormones is not going to affect the fear. That's something we've got to keep in mind. Also, what we know with fearful dogs, the hormones help them overcome their fears. We've typically seen when you neuter without really thinking about the outcome of everything, you can actually create more problems than you have. And you know, when we talk about this, when we talk about the health angle, what I've included here is just the behavioral angle. Even with health now, there's a lot of new research to show that what we thought the benefits are, maybe those are there, but neutering can also create health issues in dogs. For example, with a lot of dogs we've worked with, male dogs, they start to become reactive to other dogs sometimes. Um, food aggression issues can crop up after neutering. So my suggestion is, if you are neutering because you want to, and that's your belief, please go ahead with it, all right? But if you're thinking about it for behavioral reasons, my suggestion is talk to a behaviorist who studied this properly and can guide you whether neutering will help you or not. Because unfortunately, it's a one-way street. Once it's done, and if there's damage caused by that in a way, we won't be able to repair that. So how many of you, just as an offset, neutered your dogs and maybe saw changes, either even for the better, which would be awesome, but sometimes maybe it may not have turned out for the better, right? We've got to think about that. And on that note, you know, when we talk about People tell me, so how should dogs play? Should dogs play at all? What is good play? What is bad play? How many of you want to learn that as a topic in depth? If you want it, put it in the comments and I'll do another free webinar down the road for it. So write down, uh, yes, want a session on dog play. Because if you write just yes, I don't know what I asked you when and what you're answering, okay? I'm, I'm a little clueless, sorry. Um, you have to be smart for me. So write, yes, one session on XYZ topic, especially dog play or dog socialization. This is such a misunderstood topic. It really is. And you know, whenever I teach my behavior courses, we go into depth about how it is misunderstood and how it actually creates more problems today than before. So basic, simple rule. And this is all I'm going to teach you. It's just common sense at the end of the day. Your dog-to-dog -dog socialization happens in what we call as critical periods. You cannot socialize a dog for all his life. So if anywhere I read, say on Instagram, dog socialization gets together, all dogs welcome. I know it's basically one mela for dogs, where some dogs are being bullied, some dogs are bullying, some are practicing aggression, some are becoming fearful, and you don't know what is going to be the outcome of that. Kind of like a dog park, right? There's just constant chaos all the time. I mean, ages ago, I went to this dog park in Hyderabad and every three minutes, I would hear a dog fight breaking out or somebody else screaming at somebody. So dog aggression is separate and human aggression in dog parks is a different issue. All right, so here's basically what it is. Dog to dog socialization happens in a critical period. After which you don't really need to socialize your dog. Your dog does not have to play with other dogs to have a good, a happy life. There are so many dogs out there, and I want you to tell me if yours is one of them, who say, I don't want to play with dogs, or I only like these two or three dogs. I don't want to play with all the dogs in the world. I'm not comfy. Is your dog one of those? If your dog is, then I want you to put it in the chat box, and I want to tell you this. If your dog is playing nicely, so what is good play? Bottom line, no dog is bullying any other dog. Does it look like one is bullying and picking and the other is trying to get away and can't? Is any dog being victimized, whether it's yours or somebody else's dog? Then that is not good dog-to-dog -dog play. Are both dogs equally engaged in a happy way? Not fearful? Is the game getting rough and aggressive? Then maybe you want to stop it and pause it. Bottom line, if we just use those simple principles, 
it's not likely to go wrong. It's as simple as that is. But if your dog says, I'm not okay, let him be. He is not going to have a problem brain or grow up feeling sad if he did not play with other dogs. Dogs do need to play, but they can play with us. If they don't like other dogs, I tell my dog, that's fine. Who do you want to play with? And my dog would say, can I only play with that one dog I like and with human beings? You know, I think the time has come for us to listen to what our dogs are saying. We're so full of ourselves. And I hear this. I want my dog to be friends. I want my dog to be social. I want my dog to be confident. It's always I, I, I. And when you stop, and I want you to tell me this. If you stopped and you asked your dog, and I tell my clients this, I say, stop one minute. If I could ask your dog what he wants, what would he say? And then they pause and they say, yeah, well, he wouldn't really like it. I say, then why are we doing this? It's not needed for his survival, then let it be. And here's another thing. When you look at the last line, all play must be supervised by somebody who knows what they're doing. Not by anybody who just says, I love dogs, so let's watch. Oh, they're playing. And sometimes I look and say, that's not play. That's looking potentially dangerous to me. One dog could be picking up fears and becoming victimized and the other dog's practicing being a bully. That is not good. So in a nutshell, when you think about dog-to-dog -dog play, do it carefully. If your dog enjoys it, playing nicely, and the other dog is playing nicely with him, definitely go ahead. Let them have some good time. But at the end of the day, what you should be able to do is you should have a recall where you tell the dog, you can play with everybody, but if I call you, you must leave and come to me. I ideally should come before another dog in your life. If you can do that, then please put that down in the comment box because very, very few people can. And on that note, we're going to end here for today. And here is my gift to those of you who stayed. 